everyone, I'm Kayla. Um, I'm the social enterprise manager for Grow Appalachia. Been working with Grow for about years now. Um, and, and we'll get into a little bit later of what, what I do, but uh, for, for, for now, we're, we're here to, uh, to learn a little bit about soil health. Um, this is our first workshop in our soil health uh, virtual series may possibly turn into in-person as, as time goes on, but um, just really thrilled to have you all here um, and, and just super excited to, to be sharing this information with you all. Uh, next, please. So just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we're all pretty familiar with, with, with the Zoom uh, rules at this point, but please keep yourself muted just to keep uh, random weird noises coming in and out um, from, from accidental un unmuting. And if you all have any questions, <clears throat> feel free to drop them in the chat box. Uh, Laura's gonna help us monitor that. And the answer, or we will answer your questions uh, when, when we can, and definitely uh, they will be answered for surely by the end of the, the course tonight. Uh, next. Super large thanks, first and foremost, to all of our partners. Um, all of these folks that you see on the screen here have been working with us at Grow Appalachia for many years and have been supporting our work and have, have just been wonderful to work with. So we're super thankful for them. They have also um, enabled us to allow this class to be, to be uh, taught for, for no charge. So very, we're very grateful for that as well. Next. So as I said, I'm Kayla, I'm the social enterprise manager. I help um, run the social enterprise, which means working with growers in our service region and providing them with technical assistance on anything high tunnel. We manufacture and install high tunnels in the region, um, as well as provide lots and lots of organic chicken litter fertilizer and a feather meal fertilizer as well as lots of garden supplies. Um, we're located here in Berea, uh, but also ship everywhere else and, and deliver and, and so on. So feel free to give me a shout if you all have any questions about that or find us on um, our website. We've got a really awesome catalog, uh, visual catalog that we just released recently. So why we're here, so our soil health workshop. So tonight is our first, first uh, part of the series. We're going to be focusing on foundations. So we're talking about physical properties of, of the soil. We're talking about soil pH, soil organic matter, as well as NPK. We'll get into that later, what that means, as well as micro and macronutrients and how all of those work together and how it's all interconnected, creating the crop that you want to provide and making it healthy and delicious and nutritious and all of those things straight from the soil. So um, we'll get into deeper parts of these different sections later on. That's why I'm saying that it's a series. We will soon be doing more of these, um, diving deep and deeper to, to help you all kind of navigate your way through your own farm and the soil profiles that you all already have on your farm and, and how to make them better. Um, next, Alora. Also, if you all have any questions, like I said, throw them in the chat box and we'll get to them um, at the end of each section. <clears throat> so first, I'm going to go ahead and get started. We're going to I'm going to just discuss briefly about uh, physical properties of soil. So pretty much what I'm saying is what you can see before you invest any sort of money into getting soil samples or soil testing. Um, <clears throat> and 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 kind of looking at it and, and looking at what, what is actually going on here. You know, people claim to, the soil to be very, very similar to a sponge, right? Soils absorb water. Well, how do they absorb it? They absorb it through different textures, through different structures, um, and, how, and how porous the actual soil is. Next. Um, so what can you actually see when you take your shovel and you dig a hole immediately into the soil breaking ground for the first time. You're looking at color, you're looking at texture, structure, and how porous it is. Um, so in, in the sub, subtext of all of this, if you're looking at color, majority of the dark color that you see, the fluffiness that you see in soil is, is your organic matter. 
Um, so that's that's a huge number one sign that I see. Um, not in my backyard. <laughs> um, my backyard is not even um, not supposed to be gardened on or, or managed <laughs> in agriculture whatsoever because it's terrible soil. But um, you want to look at texture, so the tilt. Think about how compact is it. You know, um, is it harder than a rock? Like my backyard, is it full of clay? So we're talking about structure. We're talking about um, sand, silt, and clay, and what makes up the actual ingredients in your soil. And then drainage, we all suffer from that um, everywhere around the house or, you know, um, we, we, we've all been through some issue with uh, improper drainage in our driveway. So we're talking about water holding capacity and, and how, how all of these are interconnected. You know, it's like, well, if my soil is compact, it probably means that there's an issue with the, the soil holding the water. So then we're talking about drainage. So all of it's super inter, in, interconnected and, and we, could, we could nerd out for, for on this stuff for, forever, um, but, but I'll hold you all. <laughs> well, we could chat later about all of this in, in, into a deeper, uh, deeper dive. So Alora, next please. So this next slide is something that you all probably seen in the past or wondered what in the world's going on. Putting soil into a mason jar. It is the old school method of, of figuring out what your soil is actually made of um, and can be done very easily. Just take about a cup or two and throw it into a mason jar of soil. Um, you know, you want to, you don't want to get like the top little bit of your soil. You want to take a deeper dive and go about six to eight inches down um, to make sure you get down in there. But, um, you know, you're going to see after 24 hours, you're going to want to, for best results, you're going to want to wait for that long. And um, you're going to see a, a big difference in depending on your soil profile, but um, in the percentages. And so to find the percentage, all you would do is just take the total and divide it. Um, just like with a tape measure, it's, it's really simple and you can find online instructions on how to do this. Um, the or organic matter is going to float to the top and then the water and then as you go down is where you get into the actual different profiles. Um, next. Mm -hmm. So I found these really great, uh, a table and a soil pyramid. I don't know if you all are familiar with these. Um, really, really fun to play with the pyramid. Once you get your certain percentages from your mason jar, um, you run those percentages by, by, the, by the certain um, property. And that's how you find if you have a silty clay loam or, or, or vice versa. Um, and then the table to the to the left there is just a, a soil characteristic table. So once you find out what you've got going on, then you can then you can look over there and figure out what your intake rate is, what your water retention is, and so on. Um, and and I will share. We will be sharing these slides with you all um, after after. So we, you all will have this as well. Next, please. So here is I'm going to show you all some photos. Um, here is an example of what you don't want in your field. Um, this is a lot of water that's just standing. Looks like they've spent a lot of time on putting down that row cover or the ground cover. Looks like they've used a tractor to do it. Looks really tight and really pretty. Well, unfortunately, there's an issue with their water. They've got, they've got some drainage issues. They've got possibly some compaction. Um, and, and depending on your profile, obviously a heavy clay soil is going to hold water. Um, and so, so especially in Kentucky, uh, when we have really heavy rainfalls like we do, um, this is a constant issue. So really getting a grasp on how to, hold, how to figure out um, how to get your soil in, in, a, in a good shape to where it, it's filtering out the water at a, at a slow enough rate, but a fast enough rate to where it's holding in the water, slowing down that cycle and creating a, a better a better growing environment for where you're actually growing and then also the environment around it, especially if you're using pesticides and fertilizers and things like that. Next. So here's an example of, of kind of a, a microscopic vision of what the soil is actually doing. There's all sorts of nutrients in your soil. That's where the nutrients are held that feed your crops eventually. Um, Crops are not made with nutrients. The seeds don't have nutrients in them. It comes from the soil. So um, it's really important to, 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 to know and to learn your soil and know how to work with it. 
Um, the, this is where all of your NPK is held. This is where your macro and micronutrients are. Um, and so it's really important to get your soil at a good fertile capacity. Well, the, you obviously run into issues on, well, how do I get my soil fertile if it's not fertile to begin with, right? So you're talking about inputs. So you wanna be really mindful of where you're getting your inputs um, and also your budget. You wanna think about your budget because adding in compost and wood chips and manure and all those things can get really pricey. Um, so you wanna think about your scale um, and, and maybe starting slow and kind of getting bigger and bigger. Um, next, Delora. So also workability. So we're talking about tilth. We're talking about soil compaction. This soil is clearly just been tilled. Um, it looks like it's pretty, pretty heavy clay, um, but it's workable. Uh, there's, we've got plenty of producers in Eastern Kentucky that have clay like this and work in it all the time, um, working it year, year round. So it's doable. Um, it's just, like I said before, it's, it's a matter of, of learning your soil and, and, and knowing how to create that balance. Next. So here's a picture of um, just air in the soil. And when we're talking about soil compaction and profiles, obviously the more, the more aeration you have in your soil, the more that your roots can breathe, they're not gonna rot. Um, the more air you have in your, in your roots, you've got, or excuse me, in your soil, you have more space for roots. So your roots grow deeper, they grow wider, which therefore they can collect more of the nutrients that, are, that exist in the soil. So you're 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 doing you're doing it your your crop a favor by creating that awesome environment that it wants to live in. Um, so yeah, let's see. Sorry, I'm checking it out. Thank you, Alora. Um, the next slide is um, our web, web soil survey. So this is provided by the NRCS uh, for those in the of uh, the NRCS uh, USDA. Excuse me. And um, you all, everybody can hop on here and, and take a look at it. All you do is just um, go to NRCS Web Soil Survey and you'll, you'll find the link there. You just click on the green start button at the, the top left or top right there. Uh, you type in your address or a, a, a road nearby where you, where, where you live or where, you know, where you're looking at because it's, you don't have to be a landowner to, uh, to, to look at these uh, survey, the soil surveys. You don't have to, no, you, you don't have to be a member or anything. You can easily just go and, and take a peek. And it's really interesting. Um, it, it's a generalized, generalized description of, of your soil on your property from, from historical data over years and years and years. So it's not perfectly right, but it's fairly close to what your soil profile will be. Um, so even before you buy property, you all could go check out the, the, the area that you're looking at to get an idea if, if your soil is kind of a silky loam or if it's heavy clay. Um, next, please. And, and so it's going to give you those different classifications. It's going to give you drainage. If you, if you all see here, it, it, it gives you a description and then you can click into all of these and it gives you, I mean, pages of descriptions of all of these different profiles. It tells you the frequency of flooding. So it kind of gives you that, the, the water table level and also how steep the slope is. If you click on the shopping cart up there on the right tab, that's actually a way that you can save it as a PDF and then share it with family members or whoever's interested in the property. Um, I actually just had a lot of fun with this on, on my property last week, um, kind of just playing around getting familiar with it. And so I would highly recommend it. Um, it's, it's really fun. This is Bria College greenhouse property. Um, I just wanted to, to show something that's really obvious from very, very far away. Um, so yeah, like I said, it's really easy to check out. Um, we can drop that link in the, in the chat after here in a little bit. And um, yeah, so that's, that's pretty much what, what I've got to offer you all when it comes to physical properties of soil. I'm happy to accept any questions that you have, or you can drop them in the chat box and we can address them later. Thank you all so much. Passing the torch over to Mr. Mark Walden. All right. Thank you, Kayla. 
These little classifications are always fun. They bring about a lot of questions. <laughs> um, I, I will say on the web soil survey, uh, it's a tool that we use weekly in our office. Uh, so it's a valuable tool to understand the potential for uh, like fragile pans or, or hard pans in your soil. You can identify practices over time and, and uh, take a look at uh, classifications of farmland and whether a, a, a site is ideal for um, farming and production. Um, most, so, most of our soils in, in the eastern part of the state are considered not prime farmland. And that's because we have pretty shallow topsoil here. Um, so it's a, it's a challenge we're always dealing with. And because of that, we need to focus in on the things that we can do to improve our soils. And so uh, the two areas I'm gonna focus on discussing tonight are uh, soil organic matter and pH. And we'll go ahead and get started on soil organic matter. So um, soil organic matter uh, is made up of two main types, I guess. Um, we have active organic matter and stable organic matter. Uh, this is a great picture of some, what well, looks like compost that's uh, got some wood still in it. So it's, it's probably fairly active. Uh, there's still things that are being broken down in it. Uh, and it would, it's going to be valuable to, to insert into your, your soil. Uh, next. And so we have these two main areas, active organic matter and stable organic matter. Active is, is clearly a description for what's going on with that material. That means it's still actively involved in the process of breaking down. Um, stable organic matter is what we think of when we uh, use the term humus. Um, and so it's something that's gonna last a lot longer in your soils where your active, active organic matter is gonna, are gonna break down a lot quicker. Um, so let's, let's uh, take a look at each one of these. If you go to the next one, please. Uh, so there's a lot of different substances that can make up our, our active organic matter. Uh, that first picture is a pile of leaf mold. Thank you, Laura. Uh, and most of us, if we have access to the forest lands or wooded areas, we can go and get that source of or organic matter for free. Uh, leaves make a great mulch. And they do pretty well at uh, reducing um, the presence of weeds in your garden. So you can put it around your plants as a way to manage weeds, um, but then it can actually become part of that soil food web that we have below the surface. So that material becomes food for the soil life that we're trying to feed and we're trying to encourage. A healthy soil is an active soil, and that means it's got plenty of organic matter to process. Um, Kind of like us, if we if we don't have something to eat, our energy level drops, our bodies start to shut down over time, uh, and it's really hard for us to be productive people in in, a, in an active world. Uh, and our soils are the same; they need these um, they need these ingredients, they need these uh, foods to to be active and uh, and alive. Um, some other materials that you can utilize for organic matter are the next picture. Um, thank you, Laura. Uh, wood chips. So wood chips are a valuable component of, of organic matter. Um, if you're using wood chips in the garden area, you can use them as mulch on top of the surface. Uh, if you you don't want to till those in prior to planting a crop uh, because that material will uh, take up some of your nitrogen in, in the process of breaking down. 
into more stable organic matter. Um, so during the production season, you want to leave that on the surface of the soil. And then once you're, you're, you've completed your production for that year or season, you can then mix it into the soil. Uh, mixed into the soil, depending on the temperature and the activity in your soil, uh, it can take different amounts of time to break down and uh, lose its need for that nitrogen source in the soil. Um, so I, I would say if you're going to mix those in, I would give it at least two to three months. Uh, the next picture is fine, Laura. Thanks. Um, this guy is really happy to have this big pile of manure. Um, he seems a little too excited to have handfuls of manure. Um, but this guy probably also knows that manure is a critical component in organic matter. Um, most of our farms historically have had a manure component. Uh, now, as we kind of, you know, we, we, we're specializing on the small scale farms. Uh, and a lot of times you're either producing annual vegetable crops, maybe with a mixture of perennials and some animals that are going to deposit their manure somewhere in their pasture. Uh, so we lose that manure component in our annual vegetable production, uh, but it's a really valuable component in creating a diverse system below the soil surface. Uh, so each one of our organic matters, these are all active, meaning they're, readily, they're in the process of getting broken down by the soil life. Um, and that manure component is really valuable but it's something that a lot of our, our gardens aren't getting now because we've separated the animals from our production of food. Um, and obviously there's some food safety concerns with manure uh, and I'll mention that here in a minute. The next slide please, Laura. All right, so our stable organic matter. We need to make sure that we're talking about humus and not hummus. Uh, <laughs> Show the next picture, Laura. So this is a Middle Eastern dish um, made of chickpeas. This is not what we want to put in the garden. It will become good compost, but um, I would rather consume it personally. Um, but next picture, <laughs> please. Uh, so this is humus, um, or a good example of humus. So humus is the stable organic matter that's in our soil. So stable organic matter, it's, the period for it to break down can be anywhere from six months to a decade. It really depends on what type of <clears throat> material it is uh, and, and what the components that made it up are. Um, but it's the long-term nutrients that are in our soil and it helps with the, the structure of the soil and the porosity of the soil and the capacity to hold water like uh, Caleb was talking about. Um, it helps build that really critical soil structure that we need for long-term production. Um, if we're only putting active organic matter in, we're gonna have a short-term payoff, um, but the goal should be to develop this stable organic matter over time. Uh, so, Stable organic matter can be produced in a lot of different systems. Uh, it can be the material that's uh, at the bot bottom of a, uh, a uh, shallow bog or swamp. It could be that material that's decomposing in an anaerobic state. Um, it can be a combination of maneuvers and, and, um, and active organic matter that are broken down to a level that is more stable and less digestible to our active soil life that exists below the soil surface. Um, and it's really the long-term structure uh, for any type of production. Uh, our plants are using it for a lot of different purposes. They're not using it for everyday growth. They're using it as a tool to develop uh, a diverse root system to develop a diverse uh, biological community below the surface and to help store water in a way that's manageable for the plant 
to uh, to utilize the water. Uh, next slide. So why does organic matter matter? Um, and so the tilt and aeration, and when we talk about tilt, uh, Kayla showed that field that had been freshly plowed. Um, plowing your fields can, can negatively impact your soil. It's a tool for us to get that soil in a prepared state for to, to plant into. Um, so there's some benefits to, to uh, plowing, and then there's some disadvantages to plowing. Uh, but the goal there is to uh, stir that soil that we don't have a significant enough uh, amount of organic matter or we don't have enough sand. Uh, we're trying to adjust the characteristics of the soil to match the crops that we're trying to install in that area. Um, organic matter is going to be uh, the storage containers for the nutrients in the soil. Um, so they'll hold on to, to nutrients that we would lose either through um, leaching from excesses amount of water flowing through the soil profile or uh, losing uh, nutrients to volatilization. So where it, it basically evaporates into the atmosphere. Um, the soil organic matter will help hold on to those nutrients so that you don't lose them and they can be used by the, the plant that you're producing or the crop you're producing. Um, of course, it's there to help manage water. So uh, um, let's see, a good example would be, uh, if you notice when you have either snow or ice on the ground, if you go to a place where there is uh, a significant amount of leaf matter below it, uh, if you pull that snow or ice back, what you'll notice is that ground is slower to freeze in that area where that organic matter is compared to, say, your driveway or some other non-porous surface um, because it does a couple of things. It's storing some water, and that water helps store some heat energy, and that uh, reduces the, the ability of the, the ice to form there at that level. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a really creative part of our soil system um, and it, it helps manage water in, in unique ways that of course help support our plants that we're, we're trying to produce. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, they, our organic matter is the source of a lot of our stable food source for our plants. Um, our especially chemical-based nitrogen uh, applications, urea, uh, that will be utilized really quickly or by the plant, or it'll leach out of the soil or it'll evaporate into the air. And uh, after that, the plant is dependent on whatever else is in the soil, whatever other nutrients have been sequestered by that soil organic matter. And then the organic matter helps improve the physical properties. Uh, we, we, <clears throat> we'll always have some combination of sand, silt, and clay. Uh, and when we introduce that organic matter component, it's going to um, help those things come together into a, uh, a material that's going to be ideal for our plants to, to grow within. And then organic matter helps neutralize pH. And that's the next area we're going to focus on is pH. Next slide, please. So ways we increase organic matter. Um, next slide, uh, picture. Thank you. So if you're going to add compost, you can roughly add five, a five gallon bucket of compost per 10 foot of bed or row length. Uh, that's a good way to just an easy measurement to decide how much you're using in the garden. Next. And then using natural mulches are another good way of getting uh, organic matter into our soil. So looking at hay or leaves, newspapers, cardboard, all the things that soil life likes to eat. 
um, we can use that as mulch and then we can turn that in at the end of the growing season. Next, we can use cover crops and cover crops can be a four hour course that we can talk about. Um, they can be a challenge to manage at, especially at smaller scale operations, um, but they're a good source of, of organic matter over time. Um, the root systems are as important as the biomass that's above the soil. Uh, sometimes the root systems make up more biomass than what's on the surface. Uh, and having that material down in the soil profile is really valuable uh, in, in managing soil organic matter. Next. And then manure. Um, so we want to apply our manure at the end of the growing season generally. Um, because we're, we run up against the 90, 120 day rule. Uh, and you'll probably hear this in every one of our conversations that uh, discusses manure or post-harvest handling. Uh, that rule is if the crop that you're growing is gonna be in contact with the soil where the manure is uh, being applied, uh, then you have to wait 120 days from the time you incorporated the manure into the garden before you can harvest a crop, an edible crop. If the harvestable portion of the plant, say like trellis tomatoes, if that harvestable portion is not going to be in contact with the soil where you apply the manure, then you have to wait 90 days from the application of the manure. And so that's why we say generally at the end of the growing season, you want to apply that manure. So you have that waiting period start in the late fall or winter. And by the time you're ready to harvest a crop in the spring, you've already met that 90 or 120 day rule. Next. And then I think it's important to know how we lose organic matter um, in, in Kentucky, generally in our part of the state. Uh, we're looking at an average of between two and 4% organic matter. Uh, ideally, we would be in the 6% to 8% range. Uh, but these are some of the, this is kind of a pathway to lose organic matter. Uh, anytime we disturb the soil, that organic matter, uh, oxygen is going to be introduced into the soils. And some oxygen is important for our plant development and, and soil life. But it, when we turn that, we're uh, speeding up that process of, of breaking down the organic matter. Um, so we want to think about uh, minimal tillage. So tillage only as a tool to, to prep for your next crop uh, and try to do it in a way that is um, not too aggressive. So that can be anywhere from using a tarp to kill out a, a, the current vegetation that's there, or using a tiller that's going to mix the soil up. We want to stay closer to the tarping side. So say tarp, and then maybe broad fork is the next step up. Uh, and then maybe a power hair um, tiller, and then tractor, kind of in that pathway. Uh, the less damage we can do to the soil, the more stable that organic matter is going to be in the soil. Um, when we do till it, uh, the aggregates start to break down. Uh, and anytime we, we have traffic over our soils, we're going to be compacting it to some extent. Um, and so by using those natural mulches, we reduce that compaction, even just a foot traffic. Uh, as we ex expose our soils through tillage or whatever the process is, uh, we're going to lose more organic matter to erosion or, or excessive amounts of uh, moisture, washing those materials away. Uh, and so the less capable our, our soils are able to store water, the more likely they're going to erode. Uh, so if you don't have that organic matter component in, uh, the that uh, whatever amounts of water you put on that, um, that area, uh, you're going to see more erosion. And anytime we have erosion, it's pulling our organic matter away. It's, it's sending it down the creek. Uh, and then once we lose all of our organic matter, 
then our plants are going to be stunted and they're not going to grow. So we want to just be intentional about how we impact our soil when we're working in the, in the garden or in the field. Next. All right, we're going to take a quick look at pH. Uh, next. So how do we know the pH of our soil? That's right, soil test. Um, there's a lot of like at home pH soil tests. Uh, I'm going to say they're not terribly reliable and that it, it, you know, most extension offices will do a soil test for you for three to five dollars or even free, depending on your county's tax base. Uh, next. All right, so with the University of Kentucky soil test, you'll see over on the left hand side where the red circle is. That tells you your soil pH and your buffer pH. The pH you're concerned with is the soil pH. Um, the, we're looking for a pH range of around 6.3 to 6.8, something like that. Um, different crops prefer different pH. Uh, next. And so the, the, the way we manage uh, adjusting our pH. If our pH is low, we're generally going to use lime. If our pH is too high, sometimes it's sulfur, sometimes it's not, because we can have high, high uh, amounts of sulfur in our soils already, and we don't want to overload them. But generally what we see is, are acidic soils or low pH, and then adjusting those with lime. Next. And so right down here at the bottom, is the lime rec recommendations uh, to adjust that pH from 5.9 to, let's see if they give us the, the other side of that. Six point six. Um, next. And so lime will have different relatives neutralizing value, so RNV. Uh, and so this extension office gave very specific uh, recommendations on where to get your lime from and what the uh, relative neutralizing value is. Uh, you'll see that from the Lancaster quarry, it's 58% RNV. Uh, and they would recommend that you apply that at two tons per acre. Um, and then looks like the Mount Vernon quarry is 56% uh, RNV and recommend two tons per acre, uh, two and a half from the Allen Company and the Boonesboro quarry at 48% RNV. If you're buying lime from the like Lowe's or some other uh, farm store, a lot of times the RNV is, is closer to 100%. Um, but you just want to make sure that if you know what lime you're using, let the extension office know so they can give you the, the, the correct uh, amount to actually apply to your production area. Next. So why does pH matter? So this is a scale of uh, how pH affects uh, our plants taking up nutrients. And so this is the, the the group of nutrients that our plants need need the most of. And the first three are always the most critical ones, the N, P, and K, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and then some of the others that are critical to, to food production. Next. And then, so we talked about wanting want to be in the 6.3 to 6.8 pH range, but the but the uh, previous um, soil test we saw was at 5.6, I believe. Click on the next one, please. So that's about right there. And you can see that based on that chart that there's not, they're not gonna be, the plant's not gonna be able to take up a lot of nitrogen, phosphorus, or potassium. Um, it will be able to access manganese, boron, and copper, but those aren't the macronutrients it needs to grow 
rapidly. Next. Yeah, one more time. There it is. All right, so this is the zone we want to be in. Uh, and as you can see, the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, all those are in the green area, and those are the things that we need the most of. And so that's why we need to make sure our pH is right before we start planting in the garden. Um, all right. And, yep, next is get Laura. You read my mind, thanks. Uh, so here's some videos that we have uh, on YouTube uh, on pH and lime. Uh, if you want to go back and, and take a look at some shorter videos uh, to refresh what we've covered tonight and a little deeper dive on lime and, and calculating those lime rates and that sort of thing. But that'll wrap, wrap up pH and soil organic matter and I'll pass it off to Chris here. All right, good evening everyone. My name is Chris McKenzie. I'm a small farm production advisor for Grow Appalachia. So um, if you're producing for, um, uh, if, if you're selling what you produce on your farm, whether it be livestock, fruit and vegetables, uh, fruit trees, those kinds of things, I can come out and actually uh, uh, do a production plan with you. So if anybody's interested in that, uh, feel free to get in touch with me. Um, my information's on Grow Appalachia's website. Uh, but I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, the nutrients that your plants need to um, grow and be healthy. And as Mark mentioned, you know, uh, a, a big component of the nutrients uh, is related to the organic matter in the soil. Um, and you do get nutrients from that organic matter and from a lot of the things that Mark talked about, like the manure and things like that. Uh, but in some cases, um, we're going to need to rely on fertilizer. Um, fertilizer inputs for some of our nutrients. And so that's what I'm going to focus on tonight is um, what, what those different components are and how they work and some tips on how to kind of manage those for, um, uh, for farms. And of course, it's going to be different. If you're growing livestock, um, especially on a pasture scale, um, you've, you, you know, you're going to um, supplement differently for forages than you would for you know, a, 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 a garden or a vegetable crop or something like that. And, um, here at the end of the workshop, we're, we are going to uh, expand on some of, we're going to have some breakout rooms where we, you know, if you're interested in, in forage and pastures, you can go into a breakout room or if you're interested in um, uh, the annual fruit and vegetable production, there's a place and then perennial, you know, fruit trees and things like that as well. So next to Laura. So we've really got three uh, major components and, and Mark's already touched on this a little bit, but we've got uh, N, P and K, uh, which translates to uh, nitrogen, phosphorus or phosphate and potash or potassium, right? So if we've got a fertilizer bag, um, a lot of them are labeled in this way where we've got um, three numbers, right? Uh, and that first number is always going to be nitrogen. That second number is always going to be phosphorus or phosphate. And that third number is always going to be the potash there. Next slide, please. Uh, so here's just another example. Um, a lot of folks have heard of 10-10-10, of which is a very balanced fertilizer. It just means it's got 10% nitrogen, 10% phosphate, and 10% potash. So if you need all three of these, according to your soil test, um, this can be a good option. Um, but there, there's a lot of cases where you may only need one or two, and we'll talk about that too. Next slide. All right, so first we'll get into a, a little bit of detail about nitrogen. Um, nitrogen is responsible for um, growth and greening in plants. Next, please. And again, nitrogen is going to be that first number on a fertilizer bag. Um, that's, that's the number that's going to in, indicate uh, what percentage of nitrogen by dry weight is in that fertilizer. Next, please. So nitrogen is going to be highly mobile, um, and it, it moves around a lot, uh, meaning it moves around a lot in your soil, whether through air or water. Um, it's going to... Uh, uh, either be fixed 
um, which means it's coming into the soil or it's going to be leaving through uh, denitrification, which means it's going up into the atmosphere, it's volatilizing or leaching. You know, um, a lot of nitrogen is very water soluble, so it gets into the water and it flows out of the soil. Next, please. So uh, for this reason, it's not typically measured in a soil test. Um, so you can um, have a specific nitrogen test, but it's, it's usually not very helpful because by the time you get the information back, the amount of nitrogen in the soil has changed. So um, that's it's typically not included on the test. Uh, probably more accurate way to measure nitrogen is actually taking tissue samples from the actual crop that you're growing and sending those in to see if you're um, lacking nitrogen in any way. Next, please. Nitrogen fertilizers, because they move around a lot, they're very short lived. Um, and so um, they don't last in the soil for very long. Um, and for this reason, uh, a lot of times it's, it's, it's best to split the applications. So instead of putting on nitrogen once a year or you know, right at the beginning of, of planting your crop, um, you might go ahead and you know, apply it every couple of weeks or um, it just depends on the crop that you're growing, but you wanna make sure that you have a consistent amount of nitrogen available for the, through the life of the crop rather than having it all at one time in one place because eventually that nitrogen level will go down if you're using fertilizer. Next, please. Some forms are gonna be uh, soluble in water and those, those forms of nitrogen are, are the ones that really move around the most. Um, they're very readily available, so plants get to use them immediately. Um, and, but some, some forms are uh, not soluble and so they take longer to break down. They're broken down by microorganisms in the soil. And a lot of that comes from uh, organic matter, which Mark talk, talked about earlier. Next, please. Uh, I want to point out that too much nitrogen uh, really can weaken your plants. So it's really something that you want to use uh, with, um, um, you know, with, with, with an end goal in mind and, and make very targeted use because, um, you know, it can make uh, crops more susceptible to pests and diseases. Um, if you're working in a pasture situation and you apply too much nitrogen, you can cause your grasses to outcompete your, your clover and so diminish your clover stand. So um, you just got to be careful about uh, applying too much nitrogen. Next, please. Uh, so this is just a, an example of, of our organic feather meal fertilizer that we carry here at Guala Appalachia, and it's got 1% uh, soluble nitrogen and 2% that's insoluble. And what this means is that it's got that 1% that's available right away to plants and then 2% that's kind of a slow release. So a lot of times organic fertilizers um, have that slow release component, which can be really useful in terms of, of managing the amount of nitrogen in your soil over time. Next, please. So I'm gonna talk about some, uh, some, some uh, uh, forms of, of uh, nitrogen fertilizer. Um, for organic producers, producers who are certified organic and um, need that natural product, um, there's feather meal um, and blood meal, which are both um, uh, just nitrogen. They don't contain any other um, uh, nutrients typically. Uh, and it's the same for sodium nitrate as well, actually, uh, or also known as Chilean nitrate, um, which is an organic mined nitrogen fertilizer. So again, all of these are, fer uh, are fertilizers, uh, natural, organic, um, that can help you add nitrogen. Uh, fish emulsion and poultry litter fertilizer also contain nitrogen as well as some phosphorus and potassium. Um, so they, they're a little bit more of a balance, what we call a balanced fertilizer, an all around fertilizer. Um, I'm sorry, can you go back one more? Laura there. So I just wanted to point out that a couple of these, uh, some of y'all are using drip irrigation and um, maybe um, uh, needing to apply uh, nutrients through your drip irrigation. And here that sodium nitrate or Chilean nitrate um, is 100% water soluble. So it will go through that, those drip lines without clogging your emitters. And I know some folks have had luck putting in some of the fish products to their drip lines too, even though I've I, I think that there's a much more of a chance that you'll clog your emitters that way. So next, please. Uh, now, synthetic or chemical fertilizers, we've got urea, 
calcium nitrate, ammonium nitrate. The biggest thing to know about these is that they can, uh, uh, can burn your plants. So um, if you've got especially tender young plants and or roots and they come into direct contact with some of these fertilizers right at the start, um, uh, they can actually uh, 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 burn them. Um, and so you wanna be careful about how you apply these, right? Um, the organic fertilizers are gonna be much more forgiving in that regard. They don't typically uh, burn your plants. Um, so that's something that, to pay attention to with these. 10-10-10 um, and 19 19, 19. Uh, those are two fairly common fertilizers that you'll find at you know, farm supply stores or Lowe's and things like that. And they contain that, like, a, like we uh, pointed out earlier, that first number is gonna be the percentage of nitrogen and they also contain phosphorus and potassium as well. Next, please. And some other four sources of nitrogen, like Mark talked about the compost or organic matter. Um, these do contain nitrogen and, and it's a slow release form. So it can be really useful. Um, a lot of times you are gonna need to probably supplement with a little bit uh, of a, uh, more nitrogen that's more available at the time, especially if you're growing fruits and vegetables. Um, but um, compost can make up uh, a, good, a good deal of the, the nitrogen that you're your, um, your plants need. Uh, cover crops, um, if they're a, a legume, uh, like a pea or a, um, a clover, um, vetches, uh, those are all legume cover crops and they have um, this relationship with soil biology where they actually are able to fix nitrogen back into the soil. So we talked about how nitrogen likes to escape into the atmosphere. Well, in this case, these crops actually pull it back out of the atmosphere and put it in your soil. Um, so they're uh, a good friend and, and uh, like Mark said, cover crops can be a really great tool. And of course, there's nitrogen in manure as well. Um, particularly rabbit manure is high in nitrogen. Um, I would say though that, you know, like Mark said, a lot of times we're applying that in the fall. And, and so by the time we come around to, to planting again later in the season, um, a lot of that nitrogen has, has escaped. You know, we don't really want to use fresh, hot uh, manure in, in most applications. Um, and so that being the case, a lot of the nitrogen escapes from manure. So you may need to supplement with a fertilizer. Next, please. All right, so phosphorus uh, or phosphate um, is the form that's in a lot of fertilizers. Um, is responsible for photosynthesis and energy storage and transfer in plants. Next, please. And it's gonna be that middle number there. Um, so in this case, it's gonna be 4% of the dry weight of that fertilizer. Next, please. Now, phosphorus is a little bit different than nitrogen and it tends to be fairly stable in the soil. Um, it doesn't tend to move around like nitrogen, it tends to accumulate in Kentucky soils actually. So if you're applying fertilizer year after year, um, things like um, uh, manure or compost or you know, phosphate fertilizers, that level is gonna go up and up and up and up. Whereas nitrogen is much more likely to wash out of the soil. Next please. Um, so they can build up over time, next. And so probably doesn't need to be added nearly as frequently as nitrogen does. Um, you know, a lot of times you can get away with just adding um, uh, phosphorus one time if it's enough for a crop. You know, of course, as you're growing the crop and harvesting it, it's going to be extracting that phosphorus or phosphate, um, but uh, it's not going to be moving around as much um, otherwise. Next, please. And while too much can cause an imbalance, we, we really wanna be careful not to continue to add phosphorus uh, after it's already high in the soil. Um, it, it, it's, it's not as, as quite as dangerous as, as nitrogen in terms of the short-term plant health. So um, it's not gonna burn um, plants as much. And, and so in some cases, um, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, safe and okay to add a little bit more uh, uh, phosphorus than what the soil test calls for. Next. Next. 
All right, so forms of phosphorus that we can use for fertilizer, we've got um, bone meal, uh, which is an organic phosphorus product, uh, rock phosphate, again, organic, uh, poultry litter fertilizer, um, the one that we've been talking about tonight um, has that phosphorus component. Um, and then there's quite a bit of phosphorus in manure and compost. Um, for synthetic and fertilizer, uh, for synthetic fertilizers, uh, chemical fertilizers, there's dimonium phosphate, triple superphosphate, and of course, that's uh, the middle component of that 10-10-10 or 191919 is going to be uh, phosphorus as well. Next, please. All right, and then K, we've got potassium. Uh, K is just the elemental sign for uh, potassium, so don't. Don't be, a lot of folks get confused with NP and K. It should be NP and P, but, you know, it's got that elemental sign, which is K. Um, in fertilizer, it's going to take the form of potash most often. And it helps the, uh, with the movement of water and nutrients through the plant. Next, please. Again, it's that third um, K or potassium is going to be that third uh, element of uh, the the, the numbers that you see on a fertilizer bag. Next, please. And light phosphorus, uh, it's fairly stable in the soil, maybe not quite as much as phosphorus, um, but uh, it doesn't move around like, like nitrogen does. So next, please. Um, again, adding compost, manure, fertilizers can cause uh, potassium to build up over time. Next. And so it may not need to be added as frequently as nitrogen. Um, you know, again, potassium can probably be added once a year if you're just doing one crop um, instead of having to side dress with it like you would nitrogen. Next, please. While too much can cause an imbalance, again, it's typically not uh, harmful to, to plants in the short term like nitrogen. Next. And of course, we still want to add avoiding that to, to the, the soils that the levels are high. So if your soil test comes back and you have plenty of potassium, um, instead of using your 10-10-10 product, right, which has 10% uh, potassium, um, you'll want to um, choose a fertilizer that maybe doesn't contain that potassium that, that you don't need at that point. Next. Some forms of potassium um, on the organic or natural side, we've got potassium sulfate. Um, now there, there are organic and chemical forms of that. So you just wanna make sure if you are certified organic that it's OMRI listed. Um, sunflower whole ash or, or ash in general contains a lot of, of, of potash, right? Potassium. And, uh, but if you do have soils uh, that have a high pH, right, like, you know, uh, seven or 7.5 or something like that, you probably want to avoid using those because uh, ash actually increases pH as, as um, uh, like lime does. So um, manure uh, and compost also contain potassium. And uh, for synthetic, you've got potassium sulfate. Uh, again, uh, uh, sulfate of potash or murate of potash, uh, also known as potassium chloride. And of course, that final element in 10, 10, 10 or 19, 19, 19 is going to be that uh, potassium. Next, please. And just real briefly, um, there's, there's uh, other uh, nutrients that, that plants need, uh, just not in the same uh, levels as we need that, that NP and K. So um, calcium and magnesium and sulfur are going to be the big three besides the NP and K um, that we need to watch. Um, and then uh, uh, very small levels of boron, zinc, manganese, iron, and copper are also needed. Um, we call those micronutrients because you, you need, you know, small amounts of those in your soil and, and larger amounts can uh, sometimes lead to, uh, um, you know, uh, 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 poisoning of type effects. So we just want to be careful of, uh, about over applying those especially. Um, so if you get your soil test back and it, and it does recommend those, add them if you can. Um, you know, we, uh, 
it's always good to, to um, maximize your productivity by, by adding everything that's in the soil test. But, you know, uh, especially for the, the micronutrients, you got to be a little bit um, conscious of balancing cost and the productivity of fertilizer. And really at, at larger scales, for example, if you're doing a pasture crop, you know, it may not make sense to try to amend with um, some of these uh, micronutrients unless they're very, very low because um, you just won't get the return on your investment. Um, it's going to cost a lot to buy the fertilizer and spread it, and you may not get, get that back. So um, it's a little bit of a balancing act. Uh, most Kentucky soils are very high in calcium, so a lot of times we, we don't need to add calcium as, as a fertilizer, um, especially if we're already adding things like lime, because lime is high in calcium. Uh, boron can be important, especially for root crops. So if you're growing beets or something like that and you uh, aren't getting the size development that you want, boron can uh, help with that. Uh, again, just be careful so that you're not over applying boron. A lot of Kentucky's uh, soil tests come back low in sulfur. Um, but, but what the research has found that applying sulfur often doesn't really, really uh, pay off in terms of um, you know, the, the product productivity of a lot of crops. Um, and that may be different from crop to crop, so just make sure that, um, you know, you, you take that into account. Zinc is important in corn production, um, so make sure that your zinc level is good there if you're growing sweet corn or field corn. And magnesium and manganese are important for tomatoes especially. Um, and so, especially if you're um, having issues with things like ripening disorders, um, you may uh, take a look at those. Next, please. Again, we'll be covering a lot of this uh, in, in much more depth. Um, our plan is to do a focused, you know, um, uh, fertilizer and fertility workshop. But um, right now we're just talking about how this all relates to the overall picture here. But I did wanna give you some takeaways in terms of what, what all of this information means. You know, it can be a lot, there's a lot of, uh, technical and scientific um, things going on here, a lot of chemistry. Um, so here's kind of what it boils down to. Um, every crop's going to have different and specific needs for optimum nutrition. Um, now, if you're growing a variety of crops, you can kind of, you know, if you're growing a garden, for example, you know, um, you, you, you don't necessarily need to, to, to pinpoint the fertility for every single crop, you can kind of find a balance in between there and go with that and that's okay. But if you're growing large amounts of, of a specific crop, say you're growing uh, uh, tomatoes in a high tunnel, for example, um, you may wanna dial into the, the exact, the optimum nutrition for that particular crop. And in that case, University of Kentucky's got some great specific guidance for fertilizing most crops or pastures in, in Kentucky. Um, so uh, the first publication there is uh, AGR1, um, which is um, for uh, row crops and pastures. So if you have, if you're growing corn or tobacco or um, you know, hay crops or um, forages for, for uh, livestock, AGR1 is gonna be your source to, to go to, to get specific recommendations on what your crop needs. And then if we're growing fruits and vegetables, uh, ID 36 is a publication that the University of Kentucky puts out. And Alora is gonna put those uh, links to those two publications in the chat here um, so that you guys can just click on those and, and, and have them pulled up. And they give very, very in-depth information on, on each crop. Um, another takeaway is that timing is going to play a crucial role in fertilizer application. So as we talked about with, you know, the, the nitrogen, especially if you, if you don't time the application right, you can lose a lot of nitrogen and it, it won't be as efficient. Um, so uh, you may need to pay attention to that as well for, from, for crop to crop, um, you know, when certain, um, what stage of, of growth, you know, that uh, nitrogen might need to be added um, in terms of a side dress. Uh, soil and pH and organic matter are going to play a crucial role in fertility, and I think Mark already covered that beautifully, so I won't go any more into depth into that. Next, please. 
Um, so a lot of times what we can do um, in a lot of systems, and you know, this won't this won't cover everybody, but we can apply manure or in the fall or compost in the fall and spring. And that's gonna take care of um, our phosphorus and potassium. Um, and if you if you can uh, apply those, you know, that's uh, gonna um, help increase your organic matter and a lot of other components of soil health rather than applying a fertilizer, which, you know, doesn't really help our organic matter or, or soil health that much. Uh, really just feeds our plants in the short term. I think applying compost and manure can be a great strategy for taking care of the, the P and the K, and then you may need to come back with a, a nitrogen fertilizer um, just to help with the nitrogen since um, that may not be left. Uh, we want to monitor our phosphorus and potassium in the soil and only apply it when it's needed. So if we see that our um, uh, phosphorus and potassium levels are high on a soil test, you know, we can stop applying the 10, 10, 10 or the 19, 19, 19, and just go ahead and start applying, um, you know, a dedicated uh, uh, nitrogen fertilizer. Um, we want to balance the cost and productivity of the fertilizer. So, um, and, and a lot of that has to do with scale, right? Um, so it's going to be really expensive, for example, to um, uh, adjust uh, fertility on a, a pasture or uh, row crop scale. So um, we need to make sure that we're getting the productivity that we need out of that. Um, and so if you're, uh, you know, a farmer, uh, a crop, something like a crop budget can be really helpful in making those decisions. Next, please. Uh, we want to apply uh, NP and K fertilizers just before planting, uh, or if you need fertility on an established crop or pasture, uh, when you need it. So, uh, and that's because it's got that nitrogen component there. So if it's a 10-10-10 or a 19 19, 19 um, you know, we don't want to apply that in the fall and, and end up losing all of our nitrogen from that. We don't want to over-apply nitrogen and it should be applied strategically to make sure that we're not over applying and that um, the plant's getting the nitrogen when it needs it. Um, and if you can apply that nitrogen in a slow release form, you know, um, if you're using something like the, the poultry litter fertilizer or um, feather meal, um, that nitrogen um, is released a lot slower and so you don't have to go back and side dress nearly as often with those types of fertilizers. Um, and that last one there's just you know split applications of nitrogen so um, you know if you do get a soil test back and it says you need uh, 50 pounds per acre for example or um, you know three pounds per thousand square feet you may want to consider not applying all that at one time at planting but, plant it, uh, but applying that throughout the, the growing season um, so that you have uh, consistent levels of nitrogen in your soil as the plant needs it. Next, please. All right, so uh, that wraps up our presentation portion. Um, we are gonna have these breakout rooms here shortly. Welcome, welcome back everyone. Thank you. So we had a good discussion in our room. Everybody else? <laughs> I appreciate everybody sticking out, sticking it out with us. And... Never enough time. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why we'll have some follow-ups to this workshop. So be looking out for those. You know, we're gonna do some deeper dives into, um, you know, the organic matter. And uh, we've already done kind of the, the pH and the, uh, the lime type videos. So, um, but for fertilizer and, um, you know, managing um, soil at, a, at a, a pasture scale and forward scale, we wanna kind of, do a, a comprehensive series of these so that um, folks can kind of get the depth that they need to really be effective at managing their soils for their, their particular farm, so. And if there's other topics that y'all would like us to 
you know, develop some material on, or we may already have it and we can share that with you. If you have topics you want us to cover, please feel free to reach out to us. And, and uh, we love to hear what, what you need, not what we want to deliver to you. So please communicate. <laughs> All right, folks. Well, if there's not any further questions, um, I think we've reached our time for this evening. Thank you all for coming out and uh, we'll see you all next time.